Hey guys, uh, I wanted to uh, introduce you to a friend of mine and, and have a little discussion with him today. We've got Craig Williams here today who is uh, an esoteric writer, a martial artist, a doctor of oriental medicine and a lot of other things uh, from Austin, Texas. Uh, I was introduced to him through uh, his writings for Phalanx, uh, which is a, a website that was a, a joint project between a few, uh, a few good writers. and. And then I was lucky enough to get a chance to read his book, uh, Cave of the Numinous. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that, Craig, and let's talk yeah. a little bit about that work that you've done, um, what what your tradition is and sort of how the book came out of that. Yeah, that's a good, uh, my, my vision with Cave of the Numinous was it's a two volume series called Tantric Physics. And I wanted to lay out a vision of an esoteric Hinduism, um, a kind of a more modern interpretation of Vedic studies, but also keep it deeply rooted in a primordial tradition. Uh, so we could take something from the past and, and have a valid representation to it in sure. modern times. So what does the book, uh, what does it deal with uh, specifically? The first volume, uh, two of the key ideas was the guru-student relationship mm -hmm. and then the preparation of the mental space to be ready for a deeper work, okay. or left-hand work. Okay. So. so how did, how did, uh, how did you sort of come to the martial arts and, and how do you feel that that being a practitioner of the martial arts sort of affects your your spiritual tradition and vice versa? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, when, as a kid, I grew up pretty obsessed with China and Indian culture and was immersed in boxing and martial arts as a kid. Sure. And so that was always kind of inspired by that, Bruce Lee, of course. But as I got older and more in-depth studies with, with Tantra, Vedic studies, there's such a key with Tantra and a physicality, a physical representation of spirituality. And I think there's a huge disconnect Absolutely. with that in the we modern talk about that. Yeah, in the, in the modern court world is completely disconnected from the physical body. So for me, martial arts sure brings that. Do, do you think that there can be a, a pure spiritual expression without a physical expression? Absolutely not. No, I think that there is. There has to be some embodiment of the physical of within the physical for something to become sacred. And in your in your tradition, I mean, I know when we look at a lot of Eastern stuff, you know, and the thing that I think has probably turned a lot of people off of Eastern stuff um, is this sort of sort of revulsion of the flesh kind of thing, where Absolutely. the body doesn't matter, only the spirit matters, everything else is transient. Yes, totally. um, and we talked about that, you know, whether you have guys in the sort of anti-cosmic Satanist world yes. or or you know ascetic guys who are like, well, I smoke cigarettes because I don't care about my body, and it's like, no, you care about cigarettes because you're fucking addicted, addicted to it. Um, what yeah. do you? How do you feel about that? And where does your uh, area of the tradition kind of connect? Yeah, those I mean, things? how much can we see that in the left hand mm -hmm. path community? Mm -hmm. That there's there's they use that as an excuse for addiction, they use it as an excuse Absolutely. for problems. But I think that this the, the, the embracing of something physical is such a key aspect for someone to understand they are in an esoteric manner, especially in a world which seeks to commodify and turn everything into a product. Sure, sure. And so that's a key part of that. Now how about discipline? The you key know. thing is, yeah, if we can't even get our physical body healthy and our mental body healthy, anything we after that becomes a pipe dream, in right. my personal opinion. Right. So I think that that's an easy illusion for people to fall into with their spiritual practice, to ignore that. Sure, sure. And, and you know, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot too is this idea of having a spiritual practice in general. I think at this point is pretty unpopular um, in general and, and you know, oh, totally. a lot of people are, are very anti-religion and I mean, I'm, I'm extremely anti-religion myself um, as, as it pertains to, you know, the big organized religions and all yes. this and yet I still feel that uh, for, for lack of a better word, a spiritual tradition and a spiritual practice is important in my life because uh, discipline can't simply be physical. No. It, it has to go deeper than that. And so, what you know, what do you think we've we've lost, sort of? Because you know, a lot of what you did talk about in Cave and the Numinous was this teacher-student relationship, yes. and and um, certainly as someone who's who's studied martial arts myself, that relationship between your your coach, your teacher, whatever, and you is. It's indispensable. Huge. Um, and so, why do you think that has become less important and that, and that people are actually, it's not even so much that it's less important, but people are against the idea of, of guru yes. uh, student yeah. relationship. And, and why do you think that is and what do you think we lose by not having that? Yeah, we, we lose a lot. And I think there's two, two big reasons we can grasp. Number one is this easy access to information now. Mm -hmm. People can Google anything, so they think they're instant experts. And they have the illusion and they have a large amount of shallow knowledge, but they have nothing deep. 
you said, number one, so I think they think they can do that. Number two, I think the idea of having to be accountable to someone is very scary. Sure. And so people can It requires least, trust. Yeah. And so, and we've all seen, you know, horrible abuses of teacher-student relationships, but that's like having bad relationships and then people never having a relationship again. Sure. You know, you know and, and, you know, I've seen, I mean, even when you're you're looking to pick a, a jiu-jitsu uh, exactly. place yeah, of training, you know, they say, okay, these are warning signs. These are, these are people you definitely don't want instructing you in. Um, but I think that in spiritual practice, it's so much sketchier because yes. you're, 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 you're entrusting sort of this like something that can't be seen as much. You know, if, if you go and you say, okay, this is a jiu-jitsu black belt and he, she can show you that. With a spiritual practice, I think a lot of people are less able to see how that manifests itself, but it does manifest No, itself. it does. There's less tangible ways you can do that, but especially in a culture which is kind of forced to make everything equal, and there's no gauge to judge that anymore. Absolutely. In India, there wouldn't. They would say you would look for this, this, and this, but we're not supposed to do that in America. Well, and, and and again, you know, we've been we've been hanging out for the last couple of days, and and how many times do we see in in the left hand path world, or <clears throat> just the esoteric world in general, which is is by and large a fucking joke? Um, how many people you see that that absolutely are. You know the typical living in their mother's basement, black metal guys yeah. with like finger armor and a fucking cane. Yeah, exactly. You know, and yes, uh, totally. and, that, and that they don't have any temporal power, and that you know that's one of the one of the things about sort of the left hand thing where these people are saying, okay, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, and yet they don't have any money. No, they don't have any yeah. success. They can't get any girls. No. Their their body looks like garbage. You know, it's how true. can they possibly be like some spiritually enlightened whatever? And so this revulsion of the flesh thing kind of always comes in as this easy way out. Oh, it's an easy it's excuse. Awesome. And their and their whole when, when you have that, then their whole religious slash spiritual practice just becomes a form of escapism. Sure. And you know that's very. I mean, not in some uh, mystical sex of Christianity, but uh, by and large, you know, Christians think that, that the flesh is transitory. Yes. Um, whereas uh, some mystical sex of Christianity believe that, that the resurrection is of is the body. body. Um, but that that idea of, you know, the flesh is evil and, and must be cast off, you know, has always kind of really always rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah, where, you know, and you're like, me well, too. it can't be unimportant. Yeah. You know, and, and even if you if you remove the spiritual aspect entirely, it's definitely not unimportant. It's all you have. Exactly. So I think a healthy blend of both, you know, has to be stuck with. We but, have to uh, have both. Let's uh let's talk a little bit about about symbolism. You know, we talked a lot about you know some of the tattoos that you have, and also some of the symbolism that that you've used in in your books and, yeah. and some of the the art that you're going to have for your new one. Right. Um, but uh, let's talk about some of the use of symbolism that we see in in Hinduism. And I know we've talked about how you've been you've been knocked pretty hard for your use of, of the swastika and things like that. And and obviously, in in what I do, we use some symbolism that, that people say, hey, look, you can't use that anymore. The because there's no taking it back. Yeah. And you're like, well, taking it back from who? Exactly. This yeah. never belonged to them. Exactly. But, but let's talk about some of the symbolism you use and, and maybe um, some of the ways you use it. And Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the bringing up of the swastika is, ma is massive because it's a forbidden symbol. Mm -hmm. Yet we know that that's a potent ancient primordial symbol which was used in Vedic systems sure. way before anything else went awry with that. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we really need to reclaim some of those older symbols back to the deepest core we can get. Um, and with India, we can, because there's actually living traditions where we can trace that back. Other traditions, it might be more nebulous. We, we lost connections. We've talked about that. Traditions where there's big gaps in knowledge, so we don't know where to go from there. We sure. might have to create something. With India, we can actually trace these things back. So it's helpful that way to see that and, and to tap into symbols which have that, and then we can start to see connections within other systems, why they were used, borrowed. And what do you think the best way to do that is? Is to simply just use it and make no uh, apology for it, which is kind of what we do, um, you know, and we've, we've explained our point. use, yeah. but we, we've made no um, sort of apologist stuff about our, our use of symbols that people say, well, this is associated yes. with this, yeah. and you say, well, yeah. certainly this is associated with this, but like, words are associated with things that hurt too, and, and the Christian cross has been associated with, you know, war crimes and atrocity, and, and, you know, Islam and Judaism and all these symbols that now you're, you're not allowed to dislike, you know, you're not exactly. allowed to dislike, you know, the Star of David or, or the, the, the right. Islam symbols or whatever those totally. are very untouchable um, and yet there's many things from from indo-european culture that is absolutely haram you know oh, yeah, completely completely so uh, what do you what do you think the best way is to go about that I think there I think there has to be an educated representative of it on one level for sure and there, there's an inevitable amount of discussion about that you know talking about but the other part I think there has to be 
a kshatriya. There has to be someone which convincingly represents it and is not afraid to speak about it, the truth about it, and protect it in some way. Let's talk about that. Um, you know, we've had discussion about that in the past, obviously, as well, and that, um, you know, we were, we were talking last night about, about sort of, you know, what, what Operation Werewolf is and where it's going and that, yes. um, you know, for, for me, obviously, the, the ultimate goal of Operation Werewolf is a, is a, a life, reform, uh, life reform program yes. that creates whole uh, human beings, um, wherever they are in the world. Um, and that, that idea of sort of this, this enlightened, um, you know, physical cast yes. you know, of, of yeah. people that, that are not only physical but also uh, live a spiritual life and a, and a disciplined uh, mental life and all this kind of thing. And, you know, do you think that that sort of thing, uh, that, it, that it's reasonable to have in the world that we live in, or, or, will, it, or will it be allowed to exist? Yeah, world? that's a good question. I think it's, we, we need it desperately in a world that we, which seems to be a wasteland. And so I think anything that we can do to awaken that, uh, probably not everyone can do it, but there are some out there that will be attracted to it, and they can't have that and see it as, like you said, it's a total transformation. There's a physical connection, there's a mental connection, there's a spiritual connection. People talk about that a lot, but do they really manifest it? Right. And that's the key. Right. And I, I you know, I mean, and that's one of the things I think where where it's the most important for for people like us, and we, we were talking about this student-teacher thing, and that, mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, I, uh, I, you know, I always tell everybody this. I'm like, you know, there's, I'm not a world-class martial artist, lifter, or anything. Everybody, right. Everybody knows that. And, they, you know, I, I study these things with a perpetual, you know, student's mindset and Absolutely. student's understanding of them because I recognize the fact that at the end of the day, although I do not believe that I am just some guy, um, I recognize the fact that in order to learn and to grow, we have to maintain, you know, what they call the white belt mindset. Always. Where you're always, always open and prepared to learn. Always. So that, you know, I think that's one of the things we lose is that it was like my, I was talking to my brother on the phone and he said, it's always amazing. You'll go somewhere to like a workshop and you'll go to learn and someone shows up and they say, oh man, I'm so excited to learn. And then you start explaining it and they go, yeah, but let me tell you how it actually is. Always. And, and they're not there always. to learn. And, and I think that one of the reasons for that is because like you said, someone does three months of a thing and they, they say, well, I'm a fucking expert because in the McDonald's culture, it's like you know, three season. months is a fucking eternity. Oh, it's a, yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. The next season of Game of Thrones yeah, that's is a, so far Yeah, they have, there's such little vision. That's mm -hmm. all they can see. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, do you think that, that by losing uh, sort of that you know, I've, I've written in, in, in my ebook on magic or whatever, I talk right. about the idea that, that obscuring information for the sake of obscuring it, I'm very against that yes. idea, but I also understand that some information is only obscured through an individual's laziness. Yeah. It's there, and they can find it, but do you think that, that what we've lost from, uh, from the student-teacher thing and, and from, from staying on a path for a long time is just a representation of sort of where our culture is at now with saying, like, no one's going to put this time in to do anything, yeah, let like, alone a spiritual thing. There's no, it's, there's such a, we call it in Sanskrit, you know, avidya. There's such a cloud of ignorance. And so the people, and that's why people will often argue, like, I can't find a teacher, I can't find something to do. There's teachers and sources constantly around us. They're just blind to it. And they don't have what you said. There's no white belt mentality. They, all, they want to be an instant expert. No one wants to be a beginner. No one wants to be even an intermediate. But what you and I are talking about, you and I are constantly trying to learn. Yeah. We're constantly trying to meet people and challenge ourselves to grow. And that never stops. And so if you have a culture which never wants to challenge itself, never wants to grow, then of course teachers will be threatening. Sure. Teachers will be bad. And they should, sure. it's easy to find an abuse to say, here's why I don't do it. I mean, and, and that manifests itself in so many negative ways. I mean, it's so funny. My brother, Seth, and I joke so much, hey, Seth, uh, that, you know, you post anything on Facebook, right? Any video or whatever. And, you know, it's good because you get critique often from, yes. from, from people who are, you know, some of my friends and, and people in my social network are world class exactly. at, at yeah. what they do. Yeah. Um, and so it's nice when they're able to critique something, but then you will get a guy who's two months in to, to jiu-jitsu who's telling you, like, hey, you never want to do that when you're doing something. And even if they're correct, it's kind of like that Edward Longshank. It's like, who is this that speaks to me? It's like, <laughs> this advice. And uh, so, you know, one of the interesting things about that is another way that you see that manifest is the this this... We, we call it like witchsters, you know, this totally. hipster witchcraft thing that's happening now on, on the spiritual level where, you know, it's, it's 
cats and, and Tinder spells yeah. and all this. And, yeah. you know, what do you think the cure to that is? You know, for me, I'm like, the cure to that is a new inquisition where witches get burned. And then the yeah. only people who are practicing this are people who are willing to who get could, burned. Who could survive. It. But yeah. what do you think the, the, uh, the sort of remedy for that is, and is there a remedy? Yeah, that's it? a good question. I've talked about that a lot, and that's sometimes where I often, where I, where, where I try to hint at when I say we, there has to be the, the importance of danger. Like there has to be everything, everybody wants to make everything instantly safe today. Like what used to be kind of radical or outrageous, people want to take that and instantly make it safe, but then you lose everything when that happens. So I think witchcraft is never supposed to be safe. Witchcraft or sorcery is supposed to be a, a completely blasphemous, dangerous thing. Not supposed to it's be the acquisition of power, right? It doesn't believe in equality it, 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 because you're trying to, 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 to find knowledge to make you exactly. more powerful. Exactly. And, right? so, and, and right, what, you know, I talk about this with animal sacrifice, right? Sure. Now, that there's certain things that, that our modern culture sees as dangerous, but yet in their private lives they'll go to McDonald's every day and do that. Oh, but, but they'll attack us if we talk about animal sacrifice sure, or ritual. Sure. It's ridiculous. So I think there has to be some kind of reclaiming of just uh, what we kind of touched on the kshatriya the warrior who physical step up mix the physical mix the psychological i was strength. just going to ask you i'm sitting here in the light sitting how many times have you had your nose broken a couple times <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know and, and I, I think that you know uh that's important. Spiritual uh, guys, or, or, or who follow a spiritual practice and push a spiritual practice, who have who have lived dangerously. And, and uh, um, one of my uh, a guy I'm, I'm I'm proud to have as a friend. One of the individuals in the the band Nightbringer. Uh, he, they, nice. Those guys always say that, and you can tell that it's it's partially humorous because they they're certainly very self aware, but it's partially right. serious. They say, you know, this stuff has to be dangerous again, and I can vouch uh, as someone who spent time around those guys, they're they're dangerous. Exactly. Individuals. Yeah. Um, and I think that living a life, you know, and I always push this idea, you know, living a dangerous life and, and, and living an adventurous life and stuff like that, kind of, in my opinion, shortcuts uh, your way to certain areas of, of understanding that, that are much more difficult to theorize or intellectualize if you won't get out there and do Completely. that. Um, Especially in a, in a world that wants a virtual everything. Absolutely. A virtual world, virtual reality, but we want to say, no, that's that's not it's an illusion. Sure. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your uh, your newest project. Um, I don't know how much you can say about it. I know it's still in the works, but what, yeah. is, what is your new writing project? No, it's actually really that's a, an interesting t a question because that's exactly what the new project. I have a book from Anathema Books called Entering the Desert, which will be out, and that's going to be a discussion of how can we find some kind of physical connection in a world which is a wasteland or a desert, and how, okay. how we can do that and transform ourselves. And there are there are ways to do it without just saying the world is a wasteland, it sucks, and forget everything. So we talk about this some, um, you know, on the phone about how, you know, um, we're guys who are trying to reject a lot of, of values and stuff about the modern world, but we still have to live in it. Absolutely. Um, so why don't you sort of extrapolate on that idea a little more, you know, how, without, you know, maybe giving away too much about, about the book, yeah. what, what are some techniques that we can live both in the world and and separate from it in order to, to yeah. strengthen ourselves and make ourselves immune to some of the, the yeah. toxins? Uh, no, it's, it's a good question because the last thing that... You and I critique a lot of things about the modern world that anyone who would know us personally or take 10 minutes to meet us would know we live a very active lives. Sure. We're very busy in what we do. So I think there has to be a, a separation, a kind of a, almost like a cancer. We need to cut out this escapism, this transcendent escapism where people want to leave the world for someplace magical. The world's probably never going to get better in some ways. And it's we have probably a, never been never been magical. It was now. Yeah, this mythical golden age sure. that we'll return to is just a total, total uh, pipe dream. So I think, but we do have a lot of power for physical transformation, for psychological transformation. And then if we can create that environment, then when teachers come, when friends come, when people come, that we can actually do something with it. Yeah. We have to create how do that. We, how do we create that environment? And, and, and in the time in between, you know, if someone does choose to find a, 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 a guru, a teacher, right. however you want to call it, what, what are things that they can do to sort of make straight the way? And, and what would you recommend that people do um, in order to, to start to separate a bit. Yeah, I think what the first thing I would say would be what we touched on earlier was be you have to have the mindset of being a beginner. You have to be okay with learning something new. Number two, I would say there has to be a certain a certain disconnect from obsessive use of the internet, media, culture. There has to be some kind of culling back of that. Obsessive use. Obsessive use of it. Now, you know, I have no problem with media. It doesn't bother me. But using it compulsively. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, like, I have it strange when people say, like, they're addicted to Facebook or they want to get off of it. To me, it's just another tool like 
using television to learn something. So when it, when, when it becomes problematic, then that's their own life. Something else is going on. You know, and I, I think that that's something that a lot of people struggle with. And, and I know, you know, none of us are immune to this kind of thing. That, Absolutely. You know, even when you're saying, you know, and I've, I've put a video out about, you know, stop using Facebook yeah. like a drug. And, um, but, you know, as people who, who have to interact and work in that world, Completely. I certainly struggle with, um, and I consider myself a, a highly effective individual who gets a lot done yes. in a day, but I still struggle with saying, man, how much, where's my time budget going? How much time am I wasting on this kind of shit? And, and how do you, um, we'll be doing, we'll be getting together um, physically again in order to do a, a, um, an Operation Werewolf event in November. Exactly. And, and so I don't want to get too far into this, but yeah, right. what are some ways that an individual can then set up a, a daily practice, sort of a, a discipline, yes. in order to, to start to kind of straighten these things Yeah, out. the thing for me, and even within and esoteric Hinduism, we always talk about Kali, and that's a relation to Kala of time. So I think people need to have, they need to take a time inventory. Okay. They need to see where is the majority of their time going in their life. And then outside of that, I think there needs to be some kind of sacred ritual in the morning and the evening. And what could that look like for different people who maybe don't follow your tradition exactly. or, or whatever? And that's even something which I'll do in the, the Entering the Desert book and something which you and I have talked about. There has to be a primordial system which anyone can take to any system they're using. Sure. So, because, you know, someone like me, I mean, despite, you know, what's out there about, about me and like things that people have said, you know, I'm, I'm extremely cynical and, and, and skeptical and right. very anti-woo-woo kind of stuff. Yeah. So to me, a spiritual practice has to be something that is not hokey it needs to be yes. it needs to be direct and living and functional exactly so you know what what might it look like uh, let's let's sort of wrap with this and yeah. say what might it look like for someone to have an effective morning evening and in between kind of thing i think yeah, i think the most basic thing we can do is we can honor that there should be some type of solar based morning practice where the sun rises and you have something which is kind of inspiring the Germanic day. tradition that's the hail day exactly like sweet and then there has to be something in the evening which is lunar based okay just kind of and that's even mirroring our circadian rhythms and, and do you think that's the function of it what, think, do, what do you think the underlying function of something i like think that that, that reconnects us with elemental forces in the world in the, the natural universe, world mm -hmm. which we're completely disconnected from now and so that, that even just starting that creates a momentum and then from there, if you infuse that with whatever tradition you're doing, then that you have two infusions, and then things can really start to set things in motion. So you have bookends, essentially, to the start to the finish, and then you can sort of fill in the middle instead of having this kind of chaotic... Exactly. Uh, you know there's something where there, there's a beginning and an end, and there's some, there's some room to move. You can start setting some roots down. Um, exactly. and, and, you know, next time we get together and talk, you know, that's sort of what I want to talk about is that... Um, at, at their core, you know, a lot of the things that we do are, are sort of a cult of, of, of the ancestors in one way. Yes. And, and I think that for me, that's been one of the most um, effective, non-hokey, spiritual truths that I can look at. You know, and you even see this meme on the internet. And, and, and for as ridiculous as a lot of this shit was, you know, it was good. And, and to paraphrase, it was something like, you know, you're descended from millions of years of like hunter gatherer people who used to kill like fucking mammoths with spears, try to act like it. Yeah, you know, yeah, and now yeah, you've yeah. got kids like crying about safe spaces and how they've been totally. triggered by, you know, somebody mocking their like whatever it is. And so to, to find that strength through looking back and, and realizing that there was no golden age. Exactly. But, but that people, people were harder because they had to be. And although we do have modern convenience, uh, we have to shell some of that stuff away in order to meet the world a little more directly. Without a doubt, yeah. Um, and that's symbolic of us shelling away our illusions. We have to kind of break that away to get to this raw part of ourselves where we can grow and change. Instead of just building up more walls, we usually have to break them down. And that's kind of like going into the past. And the ancestor, that ancestral stream is vital. Sure. If we lose that, we lose everything. Final thoughts, uh, places that people can find your stuff. Yeah, check out my website, Ayurveda Austin. If they have any questions, they can send me with that. Um, Anathema Books for Entering the Desert. Check out their thing. Excellent. Well, hey, yeah. thanks a lot, Craig. Thank Much you, brother. appreciate it. It's yeah, been a good time always. So far. Always.